Hey, folks. I'm glad that you made it here. And uh, I hope you all had lunch, because I know the queue is horrible. And if you haven't, congratulations. You just finished the first part of intermittent fasting. The, yeah, it's a very long process, but the results are amazing. Trust me. <laughs> uh, yeah, so today I want to talk about uh, large network testing with TestGround. And uh, we, before we start that, uh, we need to remember that in the world of, in a world where um, communities form to rewrite the playbook, the next leap forward isn't just about doing things better. This is what we learned the hard way here. It's about how we can do that differently. And uh, as we go into this uncharted real world, we need to, um, Remember that our stack, build, building, or we are going to build, is not just a feature. It's more than that. This is what I truly believe. It's the very foundation of how communities can validate how the world looks like. And in order for them to validate their ideas, views, dreams, they um, need the tools that we have verified to rely on. And I think this is where my uh, adventure with TestGround brought me and to share it with you, like how my belief actually landed on TestGround and how it actually helped us. And we touched a small part of the why I believe this is so important to share in today's amazing event at Protocol Bag. And the screenshot that you see here of 911 transactions was the moment of when I saw everyone in Celestial Labs being proud of the stack that has been proven. And of course, with TestGround, as you can see, it was not just like a simulation of one particular actor. It was an automated way how we can spin up 100 validators automatically, a thousand and a hundred DA nodes, and each of that DA node was submitting a blob. This was a fantastic moment in, in how we saw that it's working. And moreover, it was not just working, we can see it. We, we saw that the results that we were putting into, we can see that the sampling is not a meme, it's, it's here, it's happening, and here are the proofs for us to verify that the tools we are sharing to our communities work so they can validate what they believe is the future. So now you see the banger that we did and TLDR, what I showed to you was literally uh, us leapfrogging to our incentivized testnet that happened because we understood that the value that our community bring during that stage of the project was valuable so much that we could not let ourselves use them as, you know, guinea pigs that just finding uh, easy bugs. So they were heavily focusing on a lot of stages during that event. And how TestGround helped us pull this off, and uh, the team back then who was starting TestGround implementation selection was really small. First point that I found amusing, and this is where people had this steep learning curve, is you actually code once. You don't do it multiple times. You just focus on one time to just code it right. Then you focus on, okay, what is the network structure? How the participants are doing there? And this is fantastic idea of how actually the implementers of TestGround were thinking differently. They were not looking at the Web2 solutions of end-to-end -end system testing, they were thinking about, okay, we have all the knowledge of how the distributed system works, now let's look outside of the box how we can test it out. Second part, which makes it even more true to life experience, is when you have an ability to configure the network per instance, where you say, okay, this validator, for example, will have 20 megabyte bandwidth, can it still produce blocks? or it will have a packet loss of 10%. If the liveness will, will still be there, or we're actually dead. Third part, 
where I think a lot of people here are getting uh, a lot of smiles, because TestGround is using Kubernetes under the bonnet, you can allocate hardware resources and actually commit to that hardware resources per instance too. Because we all had, I, I know that now I'll say flaky test and a lot of people have PTSD from their CI runs. This is where you know that, okay, if I get, if I give this node like eight cores, test ground will, because of Kubernetes, will say yes, it will be eight cores no matter what. And last point is where we got hurt when we started. Saving money. And I think uh, using EKS in test ground when uh, the team back then, IPDX from Protocol Labs, did that with uh, Bloxico, just showed that you can do the runs. Yes, paying a big cost there is totally justifiable when you do simulations, but when you forget to turn it off, this is where the cost runs out. And in EKS, if it sees that it's idle, yeah, you're just paying the less of the bill. So now you got the, all the ideas, uh, and everyone asks ourselves, same as me when I first saw all this, what should I do about it? And the answer is simple. Before you even start coding, imagine you are Christopher Nolan. This is how I believe people should do test ground. They should understand that doing tests in large networks is like shooting a movie where you have quadzillions of actors, you have so many settings, and you actually need to understand who's doing what on their own behalf. You, you, you don't go to them in the middle of a shooting scene and tell them that do this. It, it's literally a broken scene. You need to reshot the whole event. And we'll go through the stages. So stage one is manifest.toml, where we as Christopher Nolan we think to ourselves, okay, I'll do Dunkirk movie. What should I do? And we all know that there will be some actors that are the good ones and the bad ones. Like the bad ones, what should they do? The good ones, what should they need? The second one is setting. Like where are we shooting it? Like is it really true to life in that spot or we should do it differently? Like what is the clouds? Is it cloudy? Is it not cloudy? Third part, this is where people get a little bit bored of Christopher Nolan, longevity. How long should it last? How long should the scene last or the whole movie? And the same here, you see in manifest.toml, we actually don't explain the behavior. We just explain what are the prerequisites for the test to be considered a yeah, success, success run, and etc. The phase two, this is where you get the big names of actors. So in composition.toml, what we say here, as you see in, uh, from left to right, ID of validators, bridge, and lights. This is the same as say, okay, we'll have 100 Tom Hardys. Like, they'll just fly the plane. And they'll have this amount of hardware capacity. They'll have this amount of bandwidth. And let's say latency is zero. We don't want to touch the latency uh, yeah, aspects of our test run. And same with bridges. You define actors because you know that they need to do a particular job in your test run. You don't want to focus on the number of them. You can do that, like I mean, here, already we defined, like in manifest, you don't care about the numbers of them, but in composition toml, you, you start to care about that. Like you say, okay, how many soldiers we need to put on the scene to actually show that it's a de desperate situation and the boats are not there for them. You can see here, for example, it's lights. We have a thousand of them. And as you see, even the interesting part is that they have a bandwidth of 100. So we just literally said, okay, light nodes, you cannot do it like unlimited ba bandwidth. We need to be close to real scenario when every household 100, megabyte, um, 100 megabit bandwidth is kind of true. And this is the part where everyone should be aware of. Like when you're shooting a movie, you know that it's, for example, war in Dunker. Same is here. You want to make sure that everyone knows that the test will run for 25 minutes, there is this amount of uh, enemies, not enemies, troops, and this is how they will look like from your point of view. So every group that you saw with validators, bridges, and lights, they are aware of the global parameters, how, how much they are, I would say, in the, in the world of this movie. And this is where we go to the third part, the, the behavior. And this is where we saw, like in movies, we saw those like actors, like what exactly they say, what is their facial expression, what are their emotional background that gives us this perception of reality that it's actually not a movie. And same is here. In phase three, this is where we define behaviors of each actor 
We, we already defined how much there will be, for example, for light nodes or validators, but this file that you see here is an example of what a light node should do. So let's walk through a little bit here. First one, uh, TLDR, you create everything, blah, blah, blah. First line that you see here, a light node just pops up and say, hey, I'll just ask myself what is the account number I have. And I just got my account number. And this, the third point of the code that you see is the beauty of distributed state management in test ground, where you don't care how many actors they are in the world in code. You see, you're literally not mentioning any figures. You're telling test ground that, hey, somewhere in the composition of Tomo that I'll give you, there'll be a number of the validators. But here in the code behavior, just know that they'll be there. And what you do here in this particular code, you literally tell the sync client of test ground, hey, tell to the validators that all there, a hundred of them, that this is my address and tell them to fund me. Not the opposite way. This is how you achieved no single puppeteer design where you can actually scale of, like, I mean, writing tests, you can scale per numbers of participants, not because the single puppeteer is overflown with different messages across instances. And here, yeah, basically on the, other, uh, on the other side of the Go files, the validator will literally say, hey, there'll be some amount of light nodes, they'll come to me, and I need to fund each of them. And then I need to reply back to the sync client that, hey, the state has changed from my side, let the light clients uh, come back and check their balances. So in the last section here you see from light node, we actually, when we said to the validators, hey, fund me, we actually check ourselves again. Like, hey, am I actually syncing the chain? Like, yes or no? Or dashing it? This is how we check it. We just usually, we just use the same APIs as devs wrote in, in the node uh, client implementation or whatsoever. And this is the part of the test case where everyone goes crazy when they get test ground. This is where you start using it as a real dev would use it. But in a scale of 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 participants, you name it. We first check the balance here. Like, okay, <laughs> do I have actually money to sub submit blobs, data, transactions? Yes, if I have it, I'll just write a sort message to uh, the test runner. I mean, the test runner could be anyone. And then I will generate a namespace ID. Uh, in Celestia, we have uh, namespace Merkle trees where you actually define where you want the data to put in. And you tell it, hey, Here's the number of rounds that I just want to submit data, whatever data, I don't care. And you can see here, it's, general, it's just a random number of bytes that is put there. And after we have generated it, test ground is so flexible, you can literally tell it, hey, if this is actually a different test case of, we have here named get shares by namespace, could you please also verify that the data is available in the next blog or not? And now imagine the single line of code, like this, this code that uh, I wrote back in the days, it was used so many times just to test different aspects of uh, the software that we were doing. And in the end, when you finish the for loop, you just go and say, okay, I'll just check that my balances are, are deducted. When we had this funny bug uh, when we were submitting so many blobs and then the account, uh, the, the, the balance of this account was just the same. And we were like, what? <laughs> like, just for free. So we fixed that. And this is the third phase. This is the phase when you saw this like after movies backgrounds where Christopher Nolan or you yourself were just looking at the camera, like, like the output of the camera. You were looking at different angles of what the test case is doing. And the same, you need to think about Grafana dashboards or metrics or traces, you name it, where you want to look from the introspective of a particular node. And here you see a particular node uh, view of its metrics just from one of a uh, 100 validators. And you see that the block height is changing, you see that the block time is kind of flaky, and you see the number of transactions is actually growing. And, 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 and moreover, uh, because Tendermint or Comet BFT now has so many useful metrics, you can actually see consumption of the mempool, or you can see how many rounds there was to get to production of a new block. And our devs, when they saw those dashboards, and me, myself, it started to make sense. Because you can say, okay, now I'm a different validator. I need to switch to a different dashboard. Now I'm a light node, and I want to switch to this metric. And the test is running, like it's not getting anywhere. You're just having different perception of the same scene. Like, 
And this is the moment of being really proud of the team. As you see here, we've been testing how a thousand light nodes were just submitting data every single block, and all, of, all validators showed the same figures. They were saying that we can get to this block height, we can generate new blocks, and this is the amount of transactions everyone was sending. And yeah, it was a big win for us, the devs, that we are verifying what we're doing. So then others don't need to ask us questions like why this is not working. This is working. This is fine. Here's the proof. And let's go to the verified with test ground. I already told you that writing the test, you list the coding once, but the amount of angles, what you want to test is different. This is very, this is very important. First one, eight megabyte blocks is not a meme. We did it. With a thousand transactions or blobs from a thousand players. Totally doable. We verified it. Tendermint with a lot of uh, massaging, it works. Second part, block reconstruction. There was a part where we were talking a lot ourselves, like, is it working or not? And in fact, we proved to ourselves that 1,400 light nodes can actually help a full node reconstruct the block. But we understood that performance wise, it can be improved and we should do it. And, with, and test ground showed it. Third part is mempool. This is where I think one of our players, when he joined, made this very, I would say, dramatic improvement where we saw a six-fold in median bandwidth reduction in mempool. It is only possible when we did it on test ground, where we literally spent up 100 validators set, 1,000 light nodes. Everyone was just like sending data back and forth. And the validators just said, yep, with this new V2 mempool that you've created, folks, we are not eating that much bandwidth as before. And this is awesome. And last but not least, we were benchmarking, like saying, okay, a bridge node or a validator, how much light nodes actually can it serve? What is the real figures that we can share to the community? And let's go to the do and don'ts. First, yes, ship it. Focus on what matters. If you want to test mempool, test particular part of the mempool. Don't, don't go verbose. Same with consensus, same with uh, uh, P2P load balancing, you name it. Second part, dashboards. The more dashboards and metrics you can gather, the more information will be available for devs, researchers, yourself, to understand what, what, what is happening. Third part, do dry runs. Those large network tests are really expensive. You don't want to just use them to understand that you forgot an if. Last, collaborate. You don't want, in, in collaboration, you saw the fourth part, of the don'ts, solo working, this is where people fall into the trap. You don't want to just work alone and then give people context. This is where you lose context and people don't understand what you're doing. If you have the whole team understanding what is testing and why they need to be involved and what is the key actions to fix the problems, this is where you understand why large network testing makes sense. And also, what not to do is abuse test ground for small network tests. You can actually check out uh, the P2P issue on that. They wrote a fantastic quote, and I'll say it. You don't want to use a Boeing 747 to go to the grocery stores to buy some apples. This is the same for test ground. You don't want to do that. Just forget about that. There's different other tools that can help you. Reliability. Unfortunately, test ground will wrote in, 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 multiple, uh, in a multiple sense as a proof of concept. So saying that you can plug in test ground to CI is too much of a stretch. I would say that don't do it. Like just get some help. Do something different or join our gang at test ground uh, believers and start, uh, start helping us to redesign the whole thing. And what areas need test ground? In my honest opinion, I'm a big fan of PBS. I think that PBS is one of the things that was born back in 2021 in a discussion and, and everyone now is trying to understand it. And I remember that quote from the modular summit when someone says, okay, what, what would we have 6,000 uh, proposers as one builder? And I was like, well, this sounds something like test ground. You can use that. Actually, if we can prove that this works, PBS actually works, and it's not a meme, fantastic. Second one uh, is decentralized sequencing. We had a lot of bashing back and forth, like why we should care about decentralized sequencing. If test ground can prove that decentralized sequencing works, and it's actually, it actually has the same, let's say, performance UX as single sequencers, good. Communities will just go there. They will not, they'll, they'll stop debating that single sequencers is actually a great idea, like long term. Third part, L2s, L3s, L whatever, TPS wars. I think we, like in figures wise sharing, we're not doing it in good faith. 
And we need a, a, like a, a benchmark tool, something like DxOMark or Geekbench, where we actually say, hey, this L2 is better than this in this particular aspect, for example, call bytes or send, whatever, or call it smart contract. Fourth but not least, PDP load balancing, rate limiting discovery uh, speed, where you want to make sure that this is very robust and resilient. And five, I think this is where everyone loves uh, scalability issues, is big blocks. How big can we get? One gigabyte, two gigabytes, one terabyte blocks, one minute block time, whatever. Yeah, I think TestGround has all the tools and, uh, and, and, and backbone foundation to do that. And uh, yeah, I just want to thank you for your patience, and uh, I hope you learned something new. You can find me here and in this awesome event. Hi. So you mentioned um, early on in the talk that you can, that you can set um, bandwidth and latency for individual nodes. Um, and I saw, I think, in phase two um, in the group setting that you're setting latency and bandwidth over a group. So how does that look like in practice? Do you like set a certain percentage of nodes to have some bandwidth, or are you selecting specific instances out and editing those manually? Like, if you're trying to create a network full of many different uh, levels of connectiveness, uh, how do you do that? Uh, that's a great question. So uh, in TestGround, the specific example I showed you, I strip it down to the most easiest way to digest. You can actually go deeper and say, hey, actually in this group, this particular node, for example, a light node, will have one megabit bandwidth. And inside of it, you say, hey, if, in the code, you say, hey, if you see that, role, like the role uh, you can saw in backslides, it was lights. If you see the role as lights with packet loss, apply this network configuration to it. And you can fine tune to whatever amount you want. And going back to the work on our mempool, we actually did that. We were saying, hey, if you see this role, it's a V1. If you see this role, it's a mempool V2, V0. Yeah, something like that. I hope I answered it. Any more questions? Okay, cool. Then thank you. We'll have a few more minutes. Thank you again.